Hello everyone, welcome back to MKTG 1017 Digital Marketing Strategies. I'm your instructor Keith Connell. Today we're going to be talking about chapter 17 of your textbook where we delve into CRMs and lead generations that deliver results. So without further ado, why don't we jump right into our PowerPoint slide deck here. Now, one of the key components of developing leads is ma maintaining and managing your CRM. I'm going to give you a couple seconds here to think about this, but what does CRM stand for? All right, so giving you a couple seconds, it's customer relationship management software. And it doesn't exactly have to be a software application. It can be a, a thought process. It could be a way of doing business, but it's all surrounding how you relate to your customers and the loyalty that you can develop through CRM. Now, based on our, our discussions, what do you think CRM involves though? Well, CRM, what, it, what it's talking about here is any time that you have a communication with your consumer, whether it be a telephone call, an email, following up on a question that the customer had. A lot of organizations that are going through this digital transformation have a real hard time because they make commitments that are either unrealistic or not possible to keep. For example, one call center employee may promise a customer that they'll call back. They will call regardless. And of course, the customer never gets the call and that damages the relationship. So. It's the way of doing business and it's the, the overall corporate mantra that's involved with the CRM. Now, there's five aspects that I want you to keep in mind when we're talking about CRM and CRM applications to be successful. First off, it has to be personalized. You want to demonstrate that you have an understanding of who your customer is, what their needs are, what their last bit of inquiries were, for example. Um, one of the, the things that I use or an example that I use is when I was working in a call center, I would make copious notes on every conversation that I had with my customers. And the reason for that was because, say for example, the customer tipped their hat and said, oh, they're busy tonight because their son has a birthday party to go to, or it's his birthday, for example. You make note of that and you diarize it in your CRM so that the following year, you can contact that same customer and say, hey, by the way, um, what are you doing for your son's birthday this year? So these are things that really impress consumers and make them want to do the business with you. So that's part of the personalization. The other personalization is targeting what their needs are. And again, we, we keep going back to Amazon, but Amazon is the quintessential example of personalization of processes, procedures, opportunities, and product, uh, product offerings. So understanding who your customer is so that you can offer a product that makes sense to them. For example, if you're working for a car dealership and you contact them and say, oh, by the way, um, I know that you're only driving around a, a small compact car, but we just got this brand new 4x4 in that's an F350 from a Ford and we thought you might be interested. Well, that doesn't make sense because it's not personalized because the people should be aware that that customer is a compact car customer. So try to keep your communications personalized in that sense. Now, segmentation, what that means is you want to ensure that your communications aren't sending, being sent out in bulk or perceived as bulk. So it goes along the same lines as personalization where when you're talking to a consumer, say for example, you work for a, a, a grocery store chain and your consumer you know is a vegan. Well, one of the things that would tip the hat to saying that it was sent out in bulk is sending out a meat special to vegans. Well, obviously that's not very personalized and it's, it's, it's sent out very specifically. The other thing that you want to do is when you're talking about segmentation, make sure that um, it's you can segment your lists or your, your content, contact management 
or customer relationship management, you can segment them based on demographics, geography, gender, etc., and make sure that your messages are targeting those specific people. It helps out with the impression and the feeling that these are specifically going out to the consumer. Now, content. In order to have a really solid CRM campaign, you have to develop compelling content. And sometimes that content might be different for one segment, if you remember to point two with our segmentation. So it might be compelling to one section of Ontario. Say, for example, when I was working for an electrical distribu distributor, um, we had locations right across Ontario. Now, we have some in the GTA, we have some in Barrie, we had a, a location up in Sudbury. Now, Sudbury is a different type of electrical consumer because the majority of what they do and the majority of the customers that came in to see this company were of the mining industry. So for us to offer, say for example, electrical products that were very specific to the mining industry to Mississauga, didn't make sense. So you have to create compelling content based on your segments. You want to make sure that your consumers are going to read or consume whatever it is that you're creating. And say, for example, if you're creating a broadcast email, the compelling content is also not just the body, but the subject matter. So when you've got your subject line, you want to create some content where the customer needs and wants to open that email. Oftentimes what you'll see is things that, have, for a, a subject line, things that your competition wish you didn't know. Well, all of a sudden, if you're in the business world, that's something very interesting to you and you're gonna wanna read it just to see what that's all about. Number four, insight. You have to understand your customer base before you can develop the CRM. Because if you don't understand it, how can you possibly develop a personalization aspect? How can you segment your list? How can you create that compelling content? Make sure that you fully understand who your customers are before you start developing this CRM campaign. Certainly, the, an, a, one of the more important ones is customer service. Because you could have the best CRM system in the world employed but if you don't follow it up with good, solid customer service, you're going to lose those customers. So moving right along, what I would recommend is making sure that your customer service manager is on board once you start planning out the CRM system. That would be where I, I would recommend your, your most logical progress would be. Now, the principles of a CRM strategy, there's several here, so I'm going to keep this screen open while we're going through it. The first, when you're talking about content to the customers, you want to make sure that your frequency is there. How often do we contact our customers without becoming that nuisance? When we're talking about nuisance, oftentimes what will happen is, and I'll use my, my announcements as an example because I've been accused of sending out too many announcements and not enough, so it's, it's kind of all over the place. So what's a nuisance to some people isn't a nuisance to others. But you have to develop that sweet spot because otherwise, if you've got, say for example, um, you're considering going to Georgian College and they send you countless emails email after email, hey, by the way, don't forget, come to Georgian, come to Georgian. Eventually, it's going to get to the point where you just turn them out. Um, one of my, my cousins sells fitness equipment. And when she's selling the fitness equipment, she's on my Facebook, but she's constantly selling it. She's constantly putting ads up and pushing this, these new products, etc., to the point where it becomes a it becomes a nuisance and offensive and I eventually just removed her from my Facebook because of the non-stop communication it becomes a, a nuisance you have to develop that that sweet spot on your your frequency and typically what I suggest as I've mentioned in previous classes is when you're talking about creating an email campaign 
it should be only about 10%, one in every 10 emails that you send out or social media posts are selling. The other are just basic information, some, uh, some things that you might not have been aware of, just to keep the customer engaged. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is timeliness. Now when we're talking about timeliness is when is the best time to talk to our customers? When's the worst time? That can be time of day, that could be the day of the week, it could be one of many different things. The other one is that if you're selling a, a product, for example, and you've got an economic downturn, such as one that was in 2020, that might not be the best timed communication to say, hey, by the way, come on out and spend thousands of dollars on our product. Customers won't have that. So you've got to make sure that your timeliness is there. So you've got to make sure that your frequency is consistent, but not obtrusive. Your timeliness, make sure that that message is getting to the customer when they're ready to receive it. Accuracy. Now there's a saying in data analysis where garbage in, garbage out. So you have to make sure that when you're going through your CRM systems, that you make sure that the system is accurate. Make sure that the information that you have makes sense to what you're trying to do. For example, one of the worst things in the world that you could possibly do is, say for example, Mr. John Smith um, might be referred to if you've got the, the fields in the wrong way as Mr. S. John. So you've got to make sure that these names are accurate to first name, last name. You can split them up so that way your type of communication can be either informal by saying, hi John, by the way, don't forget we've got this special. Or if it's more formal, you can say, Mr. John, or Mr. Smith, here's what our products are. And make sure that if you've got that, you're also declaring a field for a gender because if you're calling this person Mr., you have to have an if statement where if the gender is set up so that it's a male, you want to follow it up with a Mr. If it's female, you want to have it for a formal, uh, formal salutation of Ms. So make sure that your, your data is accurate. Relevancy. Does your information reach your customers? And when I say reach, I don't just mean physically into their e email box. I mean, does it speak directly to what your customers' interests, interests are? The example I used previously, selling a hamburger to a vegan. Does that make sense? Is the message that you're sending out relevant to your consumer? Of course, we've talked about this in, in the previous slides. Personalization. Are you sending out messages that are responding to your customers' demonstrated behaviors? For example, the one that I have here is test driving an SUV, but marketing for a compact electric car. If the person is interested in an SUV, they're probably not thinking to themselves, well, my next car is going to be a compact electrical. So make sure that you're personalizing your information to the consumer. Of course, value, you want to make sure that your customer is getting value that they can't get anywhere else from your communication. Understand when you're setting these, these campaigns up, understand what your organization's unique selling proposition is, the USP. What sets you apart from your competition? In essence, answer the question if the customer opens that email and responds to what you're, you're sending out or your communication, what's in it for me? Make sure that you understand and answer that question as well to deliver the utmost in value. And of course, channel. Now, you want to make sure that you're reaching your customers in not only the most effective means possible for your organization, but also the most effective means of communication for your consumer. Your consumer wants to be communicated specifically with specific ways. For example, if I'm a customer and I say only contact me through email and you send me out a text message, that's going to alienate the, the whole process and the customer may not come back to you. So make sure that you understand what the customers are looking for in terms of communication and follow them. Don't guess. If they haven't declared it, 
I would send them out an email first if you haven't heard from them then you can certainly follow it up with a, with a telephone call. Now other principles of the strategy we're talking about scale. Now when we're talking about um, B2C versus B2B organizations a CRM strategy doesn't have to be so large for a B2B organization because they're selling to businesses. They're not as numerous as the number of people in the world. And the example that I like to give for this is when we're talking about, say for example, um, Walmart selling Doritos. Now, their customer base is in the hundreds of millions. That scale for a CRM is massive. However, Doritos has Walmart, they might have the convenience store, so Circle K, they might have some other stores and grocery stores, but that's a lot smaller of a scale. So make sure when you're developing your CRM, you understand what the size of your database is. Because if you don't understand it and you try to develop it too small, the, the challenge will be scaling up. So if you've got a small database, or at least a small campaign, and you've got a very, very large customer base, scaling up will cost extra money, it's going to cost time, and it could cost in sales. So understand that, that step as well. The next phase is frequency. We've talked about frequency. B2C touch points are single, they're very short. So you don't want to inundate the customer with too much information. Say, for example, if you're working for Ben and & Jerry's and you're sending out an email campaign to all of the consumers that have registered on your website, do you really need to talk about the specific specifications of your ingredient list, of how the product's made, how it's frozen, what the optimal temperature is? No, most consumers don't care. They'll go to the store, they'll buy the ice cream, they bring it home, put it in the freezer, and then they eat it when they're ready. So you, you want to make sure that it's short touches, where with B2B, if, what you want to do is speak to the customer's needs. When I was working for the electrical manufacturer, for example, when I created a, a CRM system, I had to speak very, very technical, because the people that were typically receiving this are engineers, architects. They want to know what the voltage out output is. They want to know what the lumens are that are being generated by the light fixtures. They want to know about the efficacy of the product, the reflective nature, etc. So if you've got, if you're speaking to a B2C, you're speaking very short blasts. When you're speaking to a B2B market, you want to get more technical. You want to give them as much information as you can so that if you're, you send it out to a junior buyer, for example, they receive it, they can in turn turn to their boss and say, I've received this, I think this is a good product, and here's the specifications. And that will help you a very long way. All right, the next step is interaction. B2C customers uh, have an, a relationship with a specific brand rather than a salesperson. For example, um, if, you've bought, if you look at your desk and you see the computer that you're watching this on, I bet you don't know the person's name that sold you that computer. Or if you do, it's a very rare situation mm -hmm. because people relate to the brand. I'm an Apple guy. I will only buy Apple computers. They're solid. They perform well for me. They've worked in the past. They will continue to work for me. So my relationship is with Apple. I couldn't tell you who sold me my Apple computers. I don't care because the brand is what was important. Now, if you're talking to a B2B, the relationship, if you've taken MKTG1003, which is professional selling, the relationship model of selling is very significant because people buy off of people. They'll buy off of the salespersons that they trust. They'll go to the wall for those salespeople. Say, for example, you're pitching a new product and you're interested in trying to get that product sold through this customer. Well, if the customer doesn't trust you, then they're not going to buy the product. So B2B is very specifically salesperson oriented. B2C with some products, yes, salesperson, for example, a car or a house. But those are typically one-time purchases. With a car, it's once every five to 10 years. 
for a house once maybe every 15 or 20 years, depending on the person's needs. So the salesperson doesn't really come into play as much. And then, of course, goals. You want to establish the goals where B2B CRM is often about increasing sales. What's going to get that person to close that $100 million sale, etc. Where B2C, it's more focused on maintaining your customer, keeping them happy, which if the customer leaves is called a customer churn rate. So you want to drive down that churn rate as much as possible. And a good CRM system will keep the customer engaged, will keep the customer aware of your product, keep your customer aware of new products, and make them want to do business with you. Now, contact strategy. The, best, uh, the biggest challenge that we have with contact strategy is frequency. And again, we keep talking about this because the challenge with frequency is it's, it's likely to evolve. Sometimes customers will want to be communicated with frequently, where others, they don't. The other thing that might, might pose a problem is you may be running several CRM programs at the same time. Some of them will be about retention. Some of them will be about new market opportunities. So say, for example, if you're a, um, a hardware store and you've got a customer base that you are trying to retain, keep them coming back, that's going to be one campaign. If you're trying to generate new business, that's going to be another one. And I'm going to be talking about the different types of CRM campaigns in a couple moments. So you want to keep in mind what your end goal is going to be to determine the frequency as well. There's a danger that exists that customers perceive too much commun communication is spam. And it's not actually, and we've had these conversations already about what spam is, but they, all, they, they feel that if you send them too much, you become that nuisance that I've just spoken of, or that you are spamming them. And they will end up either becoming distant from you, separating their sale, like their, their purchasing patterns from your organization, or they'll just grow frustrated and, and just stop altogether. The other thing is with the GDPR, you want to make sure that you're aware of how you're communicating with your customer, but also how you're gathering and protecting that customer's data. So very important when we're talking about contact strategy. Now, there's a couple different types of campaigns that we'd, I'd like to talk about. The first is single, and then there's the repeat campaigns. And with single, these campaigns are based around the business running through the campaign before moving into a separate campaign. Typically, it's one blast, and the campaign has no real relationship to other campaigns. It may offer a bit of a spike um, in responses or sales, but not an ongoing benefit or a halo activity. And as you can see here, you typically, when you send out the, the broadcast or the communication, you'll end up with that spike right here, and then it kind of dies down a little bit, and then it moves on. And that's when you've got to develop a new campaign. That's the downside with single campaigns is it's there to do a single blast, get it out there, generate some new sales, and then leave again. Now, repeat is a little bit different of a situation where the company will repeat the same campaign regularly over a period of time. So they continue to send it out and it, what it does is it encourages further sales. So for example, when we're talking about the single campaign, you've got the one peak, then the second one kind of dies down and then it fades off. But when we move into the repeat campaign, you've got a peak here, which is your initial, your initial communication. Interest dies down and then based on your goals, you send out another email or communication. Generates some more and then so on and so forth. Every time that the, the interest dies down, you send it out. And what you're seeing is a law of diminishing returns because what it, this does, this process is, it makes sure that your message is being seen by those who may not have seen the message or simply ignored it, but you're also, the law of diminishing returns means that 
the more frequently you send out communications, the less interested the, your consumer could be. Now, the, the way to understand law of diminishing returns, if you think about it and you're really, really hungry, because I love donuts. I'm going to talk about donuts for a second. Say you're really, really hungry and you go to Tim Hortons and you buy a 40 pack of Timbits. Oh, they're, you're just starved. You eat a few of them and they're fantastic. But as you eat more of them, they're not tasting as good as the first few were. And by the time you're getting down to Timbit number 30, for example, you're probably not enjoying them as much and you're just consuming them because they're there. That's the law of diminishing returns. So it's a little bit of an economics lesson for you there, but that's the same thing that you wanted to keep in mind when you're talking about the repeat campaigns. Now, the types of messaging, we, I'm gonna go through a few, a few of these. The first one is a warm-up message, where it can be anything, it can be an introduction to a series of compelling content. Um, for example, if you were Midas, you might wanna release a video on how to change your own oil. I know that sounds counterintuitive because if you're showing the customer how to change your own oil, are they going to go to the, customer, the company? Yes, they are. Because what you're doing is you're establishing your, your thought leadership. Now, when I'm talking to a customer, I will show a customer how to create a website because I know that customer doesn't have the time nor the patience to completely immerse themselves in the coding language. So I show them, it's a bit of a warm up. they understand, it's a teaser, it gives the customer a sense of anticipation because maybe I release a series of how to code your website. So the first step is this, then the next step. And so they start becoming a little more an anticipated as I'm sending them out. And what happens is your messages are far more likely to be open, read, and possibly interacted with than the unexpected messages that just come cold calling. A follow-up, these are opposite to the warm-up because a follow-up is after you've had a, com a communication with a customer, whether it be an email exchange or a phone call. Maybe it's just a reminder of the conversation. Many times prior to COVID, as, as you're aware, I'm also a program coordinator with the business. Um, prior to COVID hitting, what would happen is a student would come into my office, we'd have a conversation, and I would send them out a, an email reminding them about what our conversation was. That's a follow-up. It's a fine balancing act between contacting the consumer too soon or too late. So if I'm talking to my, my student, I want to make sure that I'm not sending it out too soon, that it's, it's redundant because they remember everything we talked about, and too late when maybe a deadline is passed that, that's not going to benefit them. So make sure with your follow-up messages you find that sweet spot. Surprise and delight. This is a kind of a neat one because this is just offering the consumer value. As the slide says, it's value in its purest form. Basically, what the surprise and delight is, is there's no sales message. It's not, hey, come down to our store, buy, buy, buy. It's, it's, there's no data capture required. There's no anything. For example, Starbucks has a free drink on your birthday. That's a surprise and delight because on your birthday, you open your email and you're being told that you have a free drink waiting for you at Starbucks. That's surprise and delight. A reward. Now, Casino Rama is very good at the reward incentives. This can come in the form of bonus points or a free gift or other incentives. But it's typically it's used as a thank you with the intent of bringing that consumer back to your brick and mortar or through the website. And I use Casino Rama because say, for example, if you go to the casino, you know that they've got the player cards. You put them in the machines or you give it to the, the blackjack dealers or whatever your game of fancy is, and they track how long you've been at the machines or how long you've been actively engaged in gambling. And what ends up th happening then is they establish a pattern based on your usages. And if you start sliding away from your pattern, that's when typically the casino will generate the reward messages saying, hey, by the way, here's a pair of free tickets to the latest concert, or we've got a series of concerts coming up, pick your favorite artist. And you can pick those artists 
And then what's going to happen is you're going to come back to the casino and you're not going to just typically come for the show and then leave again. You're going to come, you're going to watch the show, you're going to have dinner, and then you're going to gamble a little bit. So that's the benefit of the reward is you're bringing the customer back into your location or your website and giving them another opportunity to spend more money. Win back campaigns. These are very, very typically with telecommunication systems. So with Rogers and Bell, if you cancel with Rogers, what they'll do is they'll do what's called a win back campaign, trying to reacquire your business from the competition because you've left them to go back there. Uh, this can be a, a CRM where uh, um, it could be a, it's based on an existing relationship. The customer has no, or sorry, the company has knowledge of the customer's behaviors, so they can typically talk about a special deal that might entice that customer back. For example, in my house, we go through probably about 30 gigabytes or more of data every week because everything that's being done in my house is all virtual. We've got, uh, we stream all of our television, we stream all of our, our uh, telephone calls, we, everything is virtual. So one of the benefits that I might be offered is say, for example, if I were to leave my provider, is they may reach back to me and say, you know what, we're gonna give you three months of free internet. Well, now that's a value because it's established based on my behavior that they know that I use the internet quite frequently. So now I'm more enticed to come back to their business because they say that it costs a company up to seven and a half times more money to earn a new customer than to keep an old one. So why not try to keep the old ones? Once they leave, try to bring them back into the fold. Then the cross-selling and upselling. Uh, back in the, the, the 90s and, and early 2000s, McDonald's was great for this. What they would do is they would try to upsell. You'd go through, you'd ask for a, a Big Mac meal. And the first question would be, would you like to supersize that? Would you like to have more fries and a more drink? You'd spend more money. Um, another one would be cross-selling. Let's think about Amazon for a moment. Say, for example, we were to go to Amazon and buy this nice new dress shirt. Okay, we bought the dress shirt. That's wonderful. Now I'm going to get an email saying, hey, by the way, don't forget the tie that goes with this dress shirt. That's cross-selling because now I've got the shirt. I've got now I need the tie. And for those of you who have met me in person, you know that I like to wear suits. So now they're going to try to sell me the suit. And of course, most of my dress shirts have cufflinks because I wear the French cut, uh, French cuffs. So now they're going to try to sell me the cufflinks. So these are all ideas of cross-selling. It started with the t with the shirt, moved on from there. Lots more opportunities. Um, upselling, we've just talked about. Um, it's basically when you encourage your customers to upgrade their purchase. Say, for example, if you're in the automotive industry, you just buy a car, you might want to be, uh, the, the operation might want to sell the customer up on getting rust control or sport interior package, etc. You've got the base of your, your purchase. Now you're trying to sell and just have the customer spend more money with you. Now, Amazon, we've talked about this a lot. It's called, um, what they do is very well is collaborative filtering. And this is where um, businesses will use recommendations to encourage customers to purchase other products. And we've talked about this ad nauseum, I think. So we've got a lot of this. Um, recommendations are being filtered from other users' data or the collabor uh, collaboration aspect. Netflix has taken this and brought it to a whole new level because what they do is they utilize not just your data, but the data of people around you that are consuming similar to you. Say, for example, you're, you're a big uh, Game of Thrones watcher. You just absolutely love it. People around you that watch Game of Thrones typically will also watch show number, a show called X, whatever X means. But because they watch it, they're going to recommend that to you as well. Now, the ne neat thing about, um, about Netflix is that it's all based on your viewing patterns so the trailers that you see for your typical shows and movies are different from everyone else's trailers as well. 
based on the way that you consume. So say, for example, you'll typically watch 15 minutes of a TV show and get out of it. Well, they'll, show, they'll send you a short snippet of a trailer because they want to capture your attention. So how you consume actually uh, generates more information for the company. Now, loyalty building communications, there's a lot of, of interest in developing loyalty campaigns, but each one has to be looked at independently. And what I've got here listed is the steps of becoming that loyal customer. We're gonna move up the ladder as we're going along. So there's five stages. The first one is a suspect. There's no relationship to the brand. There's no reason to suggest that they would or would not buy from you. It might be just a cold call. You know, hello, Mr. Smith. I'm Keith, I'm calling from company Y, and perhaps you'd like to buy from us. Well, the customer's not so sure about who my company is, they're a little suspect. But then what happens is, if I catch their interest, they might show some interest, uh, like an indication of their interest, such as maybe they, they jump onto the website visit, or they subscribe to a newsletter. Well, now all of a sudden, they've moved from that suspect phase into the prospect phase, where now there's a possibility of them moving closer to becoming that customer, who, um, which is defined as somebody who's purchased from you and has a basic relationship with your, with your brand. So you've gone from suspect, where they, they really didn't know who you were, we move you up to the, the prospect, now that you've purchased, now you're a customer. But you can go even further than that, which is now you can become also a client where you've developed a deeper relationship. And what happens is that once you start developing that deeper relationship between the customer and your brand, something wild happens. That's what's called the, um, they, they become trusting in you. They, they believe in what you're selling. They believe in your product. And then they're going to turn into what's called the advocate. And that's basically showing a willingness to recommend your your brand to other consumers. Talk, uh, they talk about it. They they speak up on it. You become that. Um, you become a brand advocate. Where, for example, with me, Apple, I can tell you about a hundred things that Apple does very very well. I am a brand advocate of Apple. So that pretty much wraps up this video. Uh, we've talked about the CRM. We've talked about what it can do for the consumer. We got, we've talked about what it can do for the company. So please remember this when you're developing your strategies. Make sure that you have some sort of a customer relationship management system in place. But in the meantime, I'll see you next video. Please keep studying. Please stay safe. And we'll talk to you soon.